is being applied in our research agenda in Central Luzon. Nanotechnology is a multidisciplinary science with application in biology, material science, chemistry, physics, electronics, and engineering. The widespread commercial adoption of nanotechnology is growing rapidly and its application has huge importance in the way we have and conduct our lives. There are a lot of applications in industry, say for example, in transportation, we use nanocomposite in order to come up with a less uh, fuel consumption. In environment also, nanotechnology could be adapted through the nano irrigation for the removal of pesticide residue as well as the heavy metal residue in pharmaceutical as well as in functional foods we use nanoparticle for the slow analysis of the drugs. So So our first project on aquaculture, a development of cost-effective nano-zero life silica composite for the removal of pollutants from water and soil for fresh water tilapia aquaculture production was recently funded with a 4.99 million and 302 pesos by the Picard ERA. So for a two-year uh, duration, So the rationale of the study, with the increasing pressure in terms of the usage of water for aquaculture, the product that will develop in this project will have great benefit to the Latvia industry. In our initial study, promising results will be obtained, will obtain, improving the water quality and reducing heavy metal accumulations. Henceforth, other possible benefits and important in the study of this proposed project includes the following. This is a newly uh, started project. We have been started uh, June. So we have an initial output prior to the approval of this study. We are the first quarter of our research project. So the use of water recycling, the reduction of pressure of too much extraction of underground water source, the scarcity of the water, this project may be able to solve and contribute in the use of lower amount of water of lower ground water table source. Healthy fish, higher survival, higher income. And the reuse of agricultural waste, utilization of waste which can be converted into high value product from a local available materials. And here are the theoretical framework the root cause of the problem, deteriorating water supply, quality, deteriorating soil quantity, and what are those existing uh, problems we encounter the disease outbreak, fish spill outbreak, high production costs, low income, and ineffectiveness and efficiency of anti fish spill products. The concentration, it has a high fish demand, high intensive operation, and the solution to the problem is to improve water and soil quality. And here are the, the major proposed product, the major activity expected output to be. And here are the types of the depth and knowledge, identification of cost effective scientifically valid tests to measure the stable carbon components of nanochar. Is imperative to develop a nanochar offset protocol for carbon markets. So we call this nanochar because our material is black and then we convert it into nano silica. And that would serve as a, uh, as a component for our nano composite with nano zeolite from a local uh, clay linoctolite or nano modified clay linoctolite. And then we combine it blend together and to serve as the raw material for the remediation to remove the heavy metal as well as some other pollutants that is present in the water as well as in the soil. The objective is that to, be, to develop the cost-effective nano zeolite silica composite for the removal of pollutants in water and soil for freshwater tilapia aquaculture production. Specific objective to develop process from the not lightning biochar as raw material and to characterize some other characterizations such as the scanning electron microscopy, the photo transfer infrared spectroscopy, the X-ray diffraction, and the atomic force microscopy. 
and to establish a protocol in the assumption and desumption process involving application of nano zeolite silica composer and to study the effect of the nano zeolite silica in the absorption and desumption process. And the last portion of our objective is to evaluate the economic feasibility on the use of nano silica, silica composer chore in our own fish production and farm with vice from uh, component six. And that was and that is the pay the most uh, required by the Picard to convince them to provide us the uh, 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 approximately five million project. We have the phase one to develop of the nanotech composite and first uh, phase two is to prototype production and laboratory testing of nano like composite. We have some collaborators from different issues in the nearby university. Uh, UT Visayas, uh, from Romblon State University, from Isabella State University, DPAR, and from uh, around five to six uh, state universities are involved in the uh, second part of the study. And uh, the expected output. Another study we have is the development of the colloidal gold nanoparticle amine acid for the rapid detection of bacterial pathogen in freshwater tilapia aquaculture. My co-partner is a uh, biotechnologist and a nanotechnology and a chemist to do this project amounting to 4.9 million a duration of two years started June 2018 and May 2020. And here are the rationale, the declining production record from Wevac 2013 to 2016, the huge economic loss as a result of any fish flow diseases outbreak. In Batangas, we have we lost 8.5 million, Lake Sibu 126 million, and Lake Bui 178 million. Common bacterial pathogen, Eromonas and Streptococcus will be considered in the study. Diagnostic approaches, expensive and time consuming, highly technical, and need for cheaper, rapid, user friendly kit and develop rapid testing kit using colloidal nanoparticle. Initially we have the DEP probe for in the colorative method and two of our researchers has been published in the science red same year on the colloidal nanoparticle using the colorimetric method and electrochemistry. But in this study we use the uh, Determinations of pathogen as well as the antibodies. It's not a DNA tool. That is the uniqueness of this system. So, what are the issues? Concern is this is fiscal outbreak, costly and non user friendly diagnosis in the farmer's level. Further, we do the input the colloidal wood nanoparticle amine acid for tilapia bacterial disease detection. And what are the process involved? The development and optimization of colloidal gold nanoparticle amine acid detection kit. Prototype development and laboratory and field testing of diagnostic kit. Some of the nanoparticles are patented from the Michigan State University through the effort of Dr. Aluzelha. And Dr. Aluzelha made a, a create a nano, what I mean is the global network for nano biosensor and CL issue is one of the member as well as the UP Los Banos Biotech and they are planning also to involve the Lazal University, Salaman University with their respective commodity. In Lazal they work with the Lazal University with Mam Amalin, they work with the diseases on uh, cacao and then in marine science in Salaman University and we have the aquaculture and the UP Los Banos on food security. So and the output is the colonial wood nanoparticle and it has a rapid detection. And there are some objectives to isolate different bacterial pathogen affecting colon tilapia industry and to standardize and optimize protocol in the production of polyclonal antibodies and its isolated pathogenic bacteria infecting tilapia to standardize and optimize protocol in the biofunctionalization of colloidal gold nanotown particle to be used for amine acid and infections of different pathogenic bacteria infecting the lab here. And to develop, optimize protocol the use of colloidal gold as a rapid detection kit for different bacterial pathogens. 
have to perform laboratory and toy testing with analog rocket detection kit against bacterial pathogen infecting Tularchia and DST. And finally, to have the RDT for bacterial pathogens in Tularchia. Another one is, this is on uh, my own formulation, the EU EUP approved are on uh, efficacy testing, and then uh, I used to formulate, this is a green technology, and that is one of the disruptive uh, technology that we have with this track, the, uh, the, the, the trust of the farmer, because most of the farmer are very difficult for them to convince. To, to help us to avoid, uh, to adopt the organic farming. Majority of them are believe, they believe fully on the inorganic material, the commercial one. And I told them several times that uh, uh, frequent use of inorganic material, inorganic chemicals tend to bind the soil, and they don't believe in it until such time that when I give them a free material, for this uh, developed nanoplast. <coughs> nanoplast is not S but is Z because it contains zinc oxide nanoparticle in a unique form. This is not toxic because it is in a unique form. And then I also developed the nano the nanopolio fertilizer <coughs> with different micronutrients such as the magnesium nutrients, the copper nutrients and some other nutrients this is needed by the plants. And what is the, the advantage of this nanofertilizer is that because the particles like nanotechnology is a dimension, is a, is a multidisciplinary study which deals more on a dimension of one times 10 to n minus nine of a meter, meaning one billionth of a meter. Because of its small particle size, it can goes directly into the stomatal pathway, thus it will distribute directly into the different parts of the soil, of the plants, what I mean. And I told them also, farmer, that nanopesticide, they also develop a nanopesticide because pests and six and low dense, their system is in the nano system. The chemical we introduce, the inorganic chemical, is in the micro system. Micro system is a 1,000 bigger than a nano system. Imagine, but ganito ka, kalaki ang microsystem ng butas na papasukan niya kakaunti. What will happen? It will go directly into the soil, into the plants, and into the water. And that is the residue of the pesticide. So I told them, why not try to use this? Because if in the nano you can use a small dosage, I put in the application in my fertilizer, 100 ml per one of such sprayer. So many to say I use 100 liter for one hectare for one spray. It takes three sprays per, per season. And you look at the cost effective. The market study. So I told them that after several seasons, if you are fully used this nano fertilizer, you can help our environment, help combat climate change, help combat global warming, and help young costing. Where goes the 90%? The 90% will go into your market as an additional income. Considering that our product is comparable to the commercial one, we still earn because the 90% of our consumption will go to your pocket. Because as we calculated, we calculated it around 10% of your consumption for the fertilizer using this nano polio fertilizer. This is that uh, gold one downward is 85 days. And then after a week, we start to harvest, and it was highly affected by the climate, by the typhoon in Central Luzon. We are highly affected by that, and that is our product. And here are some of our current funded researches in our nano research, CLSU nanotechnology R&D facilities. We are about to open for inauguration rights, probably by November, and we have this currently funded researches. Two of those currently funded researches from Picard, and then the equipment, the 7.3 million was funded by Fisher to, to establish this nano, and then our building was funded by BEOR. So thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Monsarate, for 
you know, uh, citing various nanotechnology applications in uh, aquaculture production at your un university. The next speaker is from the University of San Carlos. Uh, Dr. Danilo Largo is the Director of Research, Development, and Extension and Publications Office and Manager of Innovation and Technology Support Office of the University of San Carlos to talk on driving innovations in universities, the University of San Carlos experience. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, greetings from my university. Uh, we are a private university based in Cebu, in case you don't know, University of San Carlos. It's run by Society of Divine Word. Sister Schools and Holy Name University in Bohol, uh, the Divine World College in, uh, in Lawal, and in Abra, I think, and in Gaspi, and many others. So we are private institutions, uh, but uh, we are also doing our share in uh, producing innovative products and uh, technologies. So my main topic this afternoon is uh, driving innovation in universities, specifically my university. But before that, uh, we need to know what drives uh, uh, what drives innovation in universities. You know, normally universities are the, the place where research is uh, uh, produced, you know, I mean, uh, made. Now we have a mandate from the Commission on Higher Education to see in 46 that research should be part of the uh, thrust of the university, aside from teaching and service or community extension. Universities bring experts to faculty development. We are products of this faculty development. Uh, universities attract talents and uh, uh, from other institutions uh, by invitation or by collaboration in research. And we have our early centers. Uh, we create innovative technologies. Later on, I'll show you our uh, research centers and groups. And then, thesis and dissertations are also sources of technologies and products. Uh, and then, universities can host innovation hubs and tech hubs. And so many universities in the Philippines now are hosting these uh, innovation hubs. Now, to put context into my topic is that why is it that we are talking more about innovation, not just invention. When you talk of invention, it seems that it's synonymous to innovation. No, because an idea that, it's, uh, that is developed into an invention is not an innovation. You have to put a value to that idea, put that into practice so that you can get something out of it. So it's intellectual property, it comes from the creation of the human mind and uh, put that with value in terms of commercialization and then that's what you have, an innovation. Um, I think uh, our economists here can, can, can define that more better than myself. Um, what drives innovation in universities? Um, we have enabling policies Actually, in most of the universities in the Philippines, we have policies that uh, provide uh, release time or dedicated time to our faculty to do research. We call them, we call it uh, deloading. And we have research publications and funding at merits for ranking and promotion. We could not be promoted without publications. Uh, we also put incentives for research that is uh, published in preferred journals for awards and certificates of recognition. Uh, intellectual property policies, most of universities now have IP policies that cover the creation, protection, ownership, and management and commercialization of IPs. And of course, the facilities that uh, where, where uh, technologies and products are uh, developed. And uh, we have pool of experts. We have uh, resident professors and visiting visiting scientists. We have linkages with other institutions here and abroad, and from with government also and industry. 
And then cost duplication can, can drive innovation because you have to maintain certain, uh, uh, certain status. And in my university, um, we, we practice those uh, enabling mechanisms. We have a research policy that provides a release time for faculty. Uh, we want to change the term deloading to research load because it's not really deloading. You are still doing a lot of, in, in fact, doing research is more than the time that you do teaching. Okay? Even how days are spent for research. And then implementation of an integral property policy that is also mandated by CHED and IPOPIL. And we host the so called Innovation and Technology Support Office. This is uh, actually a, a project of IPOPIL in collaboration with the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, in, in, in the generic term, this is called the Technology and Innovation Support Centers. But what's unique in the Philippines is that ITSO is based in universities. And we also have uh, technology transfer offices now uh, that is being developed, not in many universities now, but in some universities that are being supported by, by the government and through funding in this like uh, USA. We have um, uh, the creation of uh, research centers and research uh, and techno hubs that uh, what makes uh, innovation more um, more pertinent in, in universities. Okay, so I'll talk more about the ITSU project because this is what really increased the filing of patents and utility models in the Philippines. It's a project of IPOPIL that started in 2010. It's really a franchise of IPOPIL. Uh, in before, before 2010 or sometimes uh, 25, 2005 or 2007, there was zero filing of patents coming from universities. In fact, the only uh, filing was on, on, on Lagundi, I think. That was by UP Manila, and funded by DOST. Um, in 2010, when about 20 universities signed in with IPOPIL to have an ITSO, to, to host an ITSO, and this was the start of the, you know, the uh, change in the mindset among the universities of really producing not just publications, but also technologies in the form of uh, well, products also. And because of the ITSO, it made a turnaround in the filings of patents in the, in the Philippines by local residents. It changed the mindset of the academy, recognizing IP as one of the important assets that universities can actually benefit from. Okay, from zero filing in 2005 to 2007, patent filings by residents uh, started to change that by 2016, there are already 145 filings through the ITSO. In this graph, you will not see 145 in 2016. Okay. Anyway, in 2016, there were 145 uh, patents or inventions and utility models being filed in in the in the bureau patents through the ITSO. Um, it's outside the ITSO, they are still filings, no? but these are actually companies who are based here, maybe multinational, who have patents to protect for products and technologies to protect here in the Philippines. But it really changed the landscape of patenting in the Philippines with the creation of ITSOs. And these are the uh, research centers and research groups that the University of San Carlos have established um, many, many years ago. Some of them are recent, but in fact, some of these centers were, uh, were born out of projects that started with uh, government funding, including the LIDAR that uh, Dr. Lagmai mentioned about the uh, project NOAA. One of these is the LIDAR project. We are one of the uh, cooperating institutions in the LiDAR program, which uh, map, uh, which we produce hazard maps, uh, supposed to be also resource maps. But these are very important uh, 
tools in planning of the uh, local government units to determine where are these places where you can put your investments. And the research centers are the potential sources of uh, technologies and products. And I'm proud to say that uh, during the launching of the ITSO in 2012, we were the first institution to file the first two patents under the so-called 1,000 patents. 1,000 meaning the first 1,000 patents to be filed in IPOPIL, the filing fee is waived. It's called, also called the PPIP, or the Patent Protection Incentive Package. So these two uh, filings uh, resulted to the development of a startup. And that is what, what uh, really, these, these technologies were really all about. Uh, that you have, you have patents, you have, uh, you have protection of certain technologies, then it would, mean, it would mean that you are more competitive than the others because you are, you are, uh, you, are you have the competitive age. No? So, but then the su success in, uh, in uh, innovation is not measured in the number of patent filings and other IPs. It could be measured in terms of the number of actually commercialized IPs, the startups, or the, the, the spin-offs, the licensing agreements, and the business licenses and products that are developed, that are brought to the market. And of course, the, the revenues generated. We are a private institution, and we are dependent on tuition fees. And it's very painful for us now because the the government schools are, are offer free education in college, so many students are migrating to the government schools or the state universities, so that our faculty are endangered. So what then will they be doing instead of teaching? You have no students, no more students. So research is really important part of our life in the university now. Uh, most of the faculty are now encouraged to do research and produce innovative uh, technologies and products so that they can also go into um, creating their own startups. Um, I have one very nice story to tell as a product of this uh, innovation in the university. This turning uh, waste into gold is a, is a success story uh, based on the patterns that we have developed in the chemical engineering department, uh, converting Man, uh, waste from mango, you know, Cebu is the center of the dried mango industry. And there's so much uh, waste in the, in the form of peels and, and seeds that is uh, dumped into the, you know, the landfill. But instead of bringing that to the, to the, to the wasteland, uh, we get some of them and, and make them into our high value products. We can produce mango flour, we can produce pectin, we can produce uh, other products, including butter, uh, mango tea, etc. And what is it, what is uh, nice here that the company that is created out of this technology um, is now hiring people who used to come from the dump sites. They have no education, military level as well. But now they are gi given many good jobs. They can send their children to school. They can build. They can they can repair their shanties and they can buy food. They can buy clothes. We can buy even appliances now. And it's a very nice story to tell because this is what really universities should, should uh, tell. Or what, what we call as the raison d'etre. You know, uh, the University of St. Carlos has a mission mission of having a preferential to the poor, just like any other universities as well. And we, 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 um, we what do you call this? We demonstrated that here in this particular startup. So we want to have more of this. Actually, there are, there are students and faculty who are developing te technology that could end up uh, some, some disruptive technology as well uh, that, that may be useful to society later on. But it's still a long way to go to produce some kind of, some of these uh, technologies. And the most important part of our existence as a university is the creation of this te technology transfer offices, office. <coughs> Um, University of St. Carlos is a, is a beneficiary of, of the support from UC Stride to develop our knowledge and technology transfer office. There are about 10 of us in the, in the Philippines and we are happy to 
to tell you that these TTTOs are starting to change the mindset of their faculty, not just to publish or perish, but also to patent, publish, and profit, something like that. To change that mindset from publish or perish to, to patent, publish, and profit. <laughs> so, and getting innovation from the lab to the market is also still a long way to go. But, uh, we're, we're trying to, to, you know, to, to, to promote that research is really something else that will really uh, change the landscape of, you know, Philippine technology innovation. So, with that, uh, thank you very much. Oh, by the way, I have three more <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> I forgot the slides. Okay. Uh, what is the direction of the university right now? It's really to uh, to build strong research culture, to change the mindset in the in the university, more enabling policies that encourage innovation, and of course a strong relationship with industry. And I think these are the formula that really can bring your university into well more more successful university. And we are aiming to become a technopreneurship, a entrepreneurial university. Well, we hope by 2030, by 2030, we are in that uh, level already. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dami, for your presentation on the role of private universities in the creation of disruptive technologies. But, uh, you know, you mentioned about the role of reputation and commercialization as an inept labor of for research and development. But take note that research is a public good. And because of that, private universities are restricted in the production of research and development. The reason why I mentioned this is URS that we mentioned is the role of the government in making state colleges and universities key. Okay? On one hand, it may uh, challenge or divert resources towards teaching and also destroy or limit the development of private universities. I think no, uh, I'm not a presenter, I'm supposed to be a moderator, but anyway. <laughs> our last speaker, okay, probably not the least, okay, is Dr. Jinky Bornales, who's the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension at MSU Illegal State of technology in Elegant City. She will discuss the Mindanao Startup Challenge and Fab Lab Mindanao. Okay, good evening to everyone. So this, this afternoon I will talk about building MSUI's innovation ecosystem, which is a complex task in a complex setting. Now MSUI is located where Maria Cristina Falls can be found, and it is less than 40 kilometers from MSU, Mara from MSU Marami or Marami City. It has 15 major industries and it has a relatively large number of registered SMEs and it has one state university and that is MSU IIT. Now in trying to build an innovation ecosystem at MSU IIT, we try to look at the, the space at the center. We call it a space of collaboration because at that space we know that great things can happen and so we want that to expand that space. But in trying to expand that space, we also try to look at, seriously look at our competence as a state university, and we should look at our capacity for innovation. But the question then is, should we, or should we try to innovate, or should we innovate? But then if we try to zoom in, knowledge creation is at the heart of innovation. And if you try to, to zoom in again, knowledge creation is the central focus of every academic institution. So it seems that when it comes to innovation, academic institutions have no excuse. And when it comes to innovation, academic institutions have a very important role to play. The next question would be, can MSU uh, do it? This speaks about our competence, our expertise. And if we can do it, should we do it? This speaks about our priorities. MSU IIT has, uh, is uh, one of the 11 satellite campuses of the Mindanao State University system. And it is a flagship campus for science and technology. It has around, it has 560, uh, around 560 faculty members and seven colleges. We have uh, seven centers of excellence recognized by the Commission in Higher Education and 11 centers of development. 
and all of the departments of the College of Science and Mathematics are recognized as center of excellence. We also have several membership in national level, ERDT for example, the National Science Consortium. So the question then is, if Anishu Kaayeti can do it, then how should we do it? We try to consider three major ingredients here, as what we all know, we have the human resources, they are the heart and soul of every university, they are the ones who can drive the culture of innovation, the next one we consider the policies and programs, and the infrastructure. So, so far we have several uh, policies and programs that we have put in, and uh, Dr. Largos mentioned earlier the research and research load, so we also have that. We have the research and extension load. We give research or extension load to faculty members who are, who are having extension and research projects. We also give incentives to, to patent agents and uh, awards to inventors. We also have this research uh, dissemination and publication award. Now we only have six patent agents in the campus. It's a big number, but if you try to look at, they are faculty members, and so they are also. We also need to push them. So we have that awards and incentive to patent agents. Now so far for faculty development program, we have this number here. So uh, we are still uh, quite a bit far from our goal that at least 75 percent of our faculty members should have at a PhD degree and not only have a PhD degree, but they should be active in research and they should be innovating. So maybe in five to seven years to come, we can at least almost reach that one. So we have a number of faculty members who are studying or on study leave at the moment. And in terms of research outputs, we have relatively a sexy number this time compared to 10 years ago. Although it's sexy at the moment, but to sustain this number is always a challenge and it's always a work in, in progress. And in terms of research funded, uh, in terms of funded researches, we also have a relatively, I mean, a number, sorry. So this one here, we have externally funded researches. These are researches funded by government agencies and other international agencies, and we also have internally funded researches. And for IP, Sir Danny has made mention about intellectual property earlier. So for 2017, we have this number for our intellectual property assets. For the six patent agents, we really try to push them to, to, really, to really mainstream IP management and utilization in the campus. And in trying also to reach the community, we organize several major events. We have, in every quarter, we organize events so that we can at least uh, level up the, uh, the uh, awareness of our surrounding community, what IAP has been doing, and also to engage them and also to encourage collaboration with them. Like for example, for the month of August, we have Innovation Convergence, and this coming November, we have the Building Resilient Communities, and so on. Okay, so in writing innovation or in building an innovation ecosystem, we also have to consider learning spaces where we can promote in the culture of innovation, where we can extract the creativity and innovativeness of every faculty members and students. So, so far from 2016 to date, we have established five infrastructure, and that includes the negotiation center with DTI, and we have the Fab Lab Mindanao, which is the first Fab Lab in Mindanao funded by DTI and DUSC, and we have this uh, TBI, Technology Business Incubator, which we dub as IDEA, which is also the first TBI in Mindanao funded by DOSC. And we have this, sorry. We have this uh, uh, PRISM. PRISM stands for Premier Research Institute, Institute for Science and Mathematics. And uh, we also have the Knowledge Technology Transfer Office. So this all in the, these infrastructures cannot be made possible without the support and the collaboration of the different agencies of, um, of the different agencies of our country. So we have the DUSC, the CHED, the DTI, and the USAID Stride. Okay, so just recently we also have launched the Bioproducts Research Lab, and majority or all of the research done at this lab is funded by DUSC. So we, uh, we were able to establish Fabla for almost I mean, around two years. So this was, this photo was taken during the launching and no other than Unders, Undersecretary Maglayam was there. And we have the director, regional director of DTI. 
uh, uh, Director Bunyao and the Director, Regional Director of DOSC, Director Alamban, and the like is our Chancellor. So, so far for the past two years, we were able to, to cater a number of students, faculty researchers, a number of SMEs, and uh, we were able to have some proto number of prototypes. And we were able to assist some of the student projects. And the hashtag there is one of the finalists, top three finalists of the Philippine Startup Challenge organized by the ICT. And the topic there, the car was uh, transported to Singapore early this year to compete with the EcoShell Marathon. So those were projects which were assisted by our Fab Lab. And also, innovation is not an exclusive thing. So we also try to reach our younger minds, uh, the elementary kids. So we have the Summer Fab Lab every year, where we try to teach our elementary students how to code and how to uh, 3D printing. So they have a very, uh, a very uh, good time in the Fab Lab. And uh, so again, different events to to tell the community or to, 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 to send a message to our surrounding community what FabLab can do and what they can do with FabLab. So these are just some of the activities that we have organized. And if it only took us two years to establish the FabLab, it took us almost seven years to establish the PBI. But it's a worthwhile journey. It started in 2009, I, I started to assume the office in 2012. And there was a proposal submitted to the OSC in 2011, and there were some revisions. And we revived the proposal in 2013, and finally we got the grant in 2015. And so far, for, for the past two years that we were operating as CBI, we were able to organize 65, 69 events and visited 34 schools across Mindanao, and able to form 25 startups. And this is our banner program, the Mindanao Startup Challenge, where for the past uh, two years we were able to have 18 startups. The, the demo truck there, the team for the demo truck will go to Australia this, uh, this uh, October. It's spearheaded by the College of Nursing. It is a tracker for those persons with dementia. And the hashtag there, it's a tracker for, for you know, itong mga, mga dogs na naglalakan <laughs> If you have an expensive dog, then you can put a tracker there. And also, as what I had made mention earlier, innovation is not an exclusive thing. So we also try to reach the senior, the senior high students. So trying to teach them uh, how to pitch, how to make uh, some sort of business plan. And so this is in partnership also with DPI. This is with Davos Team Premium. So we have several hackathons of different things, tourism, health, and peace. And the, the next infrastructure is the PRISM, the Premier Research Institute for Science and Mathematics. It also took us almost seven years to establish the, the infrastructure. I was the dean at the College of Science and Mathematics in 2010, and we crafted a concept proposal. The main purpose of that is to help to provide space for our graduate students and our faculty members who, who are doing graduate studies from, from outside Mindanao, so that when they come back, they will have a decent space to do advanced advanced research and even and even uh, cutting edge research. So it houses nine research clusters and one of them is biotechnology, renewable energy and biodiversity. And the and the value program for this uh, research infrastructure is what we call D3MP, which stands for discovery, discovery, development and delivery of natural products. So the last one is the Knowledge Technology Transfer Office. It took us also almost seven years to establish the Knowledge Technology Transfer Office. But as early as 2010, we are already starting, we were already starting capacitating our people. That's why we were able to produce six patent agents at the moment. So it was uh, last year that we were have a groundbreaking for this uh, a building of the KTTO. So hopefully next year we will have already the complete structure. Okay, so we have this first product as a product of our research industry uh, academic partnership, uh, the Functional Food Supplement, which is in partnership with Yotatec Biopharma in, in Cavite. It's derived from, from, from a root crop. So some challenges. So we all know this landscape that on one side you have to consider the different priorities and programs of the government and the different national and local needs, but on the other side you also have to consider our network and linkages and collaboration with the different stakeholders. But at the center, we must be very serious about 
to look at our competence and readiness for research and innovation as an academic institution. And the complexity of the task is we all know this one. It's painful at times, it's complicated at times, but at the end of the day, if you are able to come up with something that would really benefit our community, it's somehow kind of a fulfillment. Okay, so, and the other one with the emergence of Industry 4.0. These are some of the challenges that we have to face. And as academic institution, we have to seriously look into this so that our graduates will be able to embrace the different challenges and opportunities of Industry 4.0. As what Jackman has once said, that unless we change our education system, our, student, our, our kids or our children cannot compete with robots. There is some grain of truth in that. Okay, so, and if we try to innovate, we have to find our own niche. Otherwise, we will just be imitating some, somebody or something else. Okay, some thoughts is that careful planning is a must. Otherwise, we will just be wasting our very limited resources. And the other one is we, we talk about innovation. When we talk about innovation, it's a we thing. So it's uh, collaboration is the key because when we collaborate, we are building relationships. And we will be, when we build relationships, it's easy for us to celebrate creativity. And when we are able to celebrate creativity, we can be rest assured that the future of research and innovation can thrive. So the hands are Thank you. You know, I have to laud my, the three speakers, no? very efficient in their presentation. I think the only inefficient is the moderator, okay? So, um, <laughs> I think we're, uh, we can accommodate one or two questions, if you don't mind. Three, okay. I think they're all hungry, okay, so. Uh, please just approach the microphone, introduce yourself and your institution, uh, affiliated uh, institution, and then your question or comment. Um, if there are none, uh, as moderator, I will declare this session closed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tuliao, and all the speakers for session two. Now we call on for the synthesis of all the discussions and closing remarks, Attorney Salma Pierasul, Director, Islamic Legal Studies UP Law Center, and the UP representative to PASTN. Attorney Good morning, uh, good afternoon. I promise to make it short lest I be accused of violating your human right to food. Okay. Um, Dr. Ray has set the tone for today's symposium, um, discussing the relevance of the theme and how it relates to APEC concerns. Uh, Dr. Kimba introduced the Philippine APEC Study Centers Network to you for those of our guests who are not part of the network. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Aldaba, essentially said that technology is a tool and it's up to us people to harness the tool uh, to aid us in our development. Although she said that unfortunately the Philippines, a uh, large part of our country is still in uh, stage two the second industrial revolution, meaning use of uh, machines. And uh, human capital, the development of human capital is the key to ensure inclusivity and that perhaps uh, we should focus on this to make sure that no sector is left behind. And inclusive innovation would be the appropriate strategy. Now for the first session, uh, this focus on current researches, recent researches and programs of the University of the Philippines. Uh, we chose this diverse group of uh, researchers, right? From the fascinating satellite and technology, space technology, to relevant uh, researches such as disaster risk and reduction management. And um, to, a more, to the more mundane but equally important how technology would impact our access to public health and services and how best to use technology to improve the lives of what we in UP are here 
uh, for is to improve the lives of majority of the population who are mostly underserved and most often do not, well, most, of, most often than not marginalized. So Professor Banyes talked about, of course, us lawyers, we want to focus on the law. On regulatory issues involving financial technology and the blockchain, um, that all sorts of structuring of economic activities, this refers to fintech, uh, main major issues would be on the type of services that would be included and the co conflict with respect to jurisdiction. Uh, Dr. Mahar Lagmai again gave us an excellent presentation about Project NOAA. Uh, we all witnessed even worldwide, how disaster, natural calamities impact uh, communities. Look at what's happening to Indonesia, right? And most the most recent typhoon that devastated Naga City. I think they're still uh, ex trying to get hold of uh, bodies that were buried in the mudslides. So he wanted to focus on let's not use disruptive technology, but rather disruptive science and addressing such science often destabilizes industry, but then it also affords opportunities and challenges. Uh, but for this to work, there must be trust, which requires open data, open access, among others, and open science. Dr. Joel Marciano focused on changing looking at the changing aspect of computing, which includes for millennials like uh, Michelle, the only millennial here, I think, <laughs> on social computing, and that the most effective technology is one that disappears. Um, he says that we should not, we in the university and we in the Philippines should not boast that we launch uh, a satellite, uh, but he said, we look at, it's not just about launching satellite, but the use of data and developing a strong local industrial base that we may build satellites, but we should also build people. So promoting uh, courses like uh, systems engineering, uh, data science, and a key critical issue is information poverty. Dr. Grace Samon and Dr. Emmanuel Lignana talked about transforming governance and regulation through technology. We know, all of us know for a fact, that local governments may have undergone digital transformation, but not enough. Uh, they face several barriers, including uh, lack of understanding by key policymakers and by key executives funding or the organizational mobility among others. Uh, Dr. Cecilia Lazarte also focused on the application of technology in research program that impacts public health and medical science. Uh, mapping of urban resources of the country, technology using and making it more efficient, faster retrieval of data, including the deter determination of the mole molecular content of herbs and others. And another an issue that uh, that she cited is uh, competition with the larger pharmaceutical companies. Um, and that the implementation of the Technology Transfer Act may in fact be a disincentive which results in the pirating of the much needed researchers from the academy second session as was efficiently moderated by Dr. Kia. Uh, focused on the researches done by the other network members led by Dr. Monserrate, who introduced us to the use of nanotechnology in aquaculture. That was really enlightening. We were just discussing how nanotechnology would probably impact uh, Maybe uh, some of some of the network members may look at uh, genetic composition of humans. Right? I think there's among there's a study I think that has been, been done. Uh, 
um, Dr. Danilo Largo focus on why is it innovation and not invention? And that the creation of the human mind is needed, you must place value and the effectiveness of such. Therefore, research is strongly encouraged to increase productivity of faculty members and application of research such as promotion of startups ultimately benefits communities and there is a strong need to develop the research culture in each of the academic institutions who are part of the ASAM network. Dr. Bernades uh, belongs to the MSU group. Uh, IIT has been in the forefront in terms of uh, academic excellence in the sciences of, in the MSU network. Um, she highlights the functions of academic institutions, which according to her, should primarily be the promotion of innovation. And that academic institutions are also expected to be not only the source of research, but to trigger such activities as part of its goal of attaining academic excellence. Of course, securing competencies would also be the challenges like upskilling, reskilling, etc. And this, in a nutshell, is what we have discussed uh, this from 9 o'clock to 1. And with this, I bid you thank you for uh, tolerating the little technological difficulties we had. And again, echoing Authority Pulut uh, message, we hope you enjoyed uh, using the facilities of the University of the Philippines here in uh, BGC. Uh, we are, as Atwadi Kulumbayit said, open. You may wish to use or avail of our facilities. Just call Atwadi Kulumbayit. Um, in, in fact, we encourage other institutions, other organizations to use the facility because we think it's part of the university's uh, uh, duty to provide access to information to the rest of society and of our community. Thank you and good day. Outside and and then resume the for the general assembly.